and among us. Have your liberty, Lord, and just let every thought, every word, everything that's said and done, Lord, take good pleasure in your heart. And let it be a blessing, Father, that as we lift up Jesus, you would draw people to yourself, young and old, Lord. We know that you draw the children as much as you draw the adults. God, that you would just reach forth by the power of the Holy Spirit into each life tonight and minister by the power of your love into our lives. God, that you would bless this precious family. Lord, that you would minister to them even as they pour out in ministry to us. And God, that you would just provide for them in every way, spirit, soul, and body. And Lord, every house, every need in the house represented will be met tonight, Lord. That you are the God of miracles. You specialize in things called impossible. And you are glorified when we just give you honor and glory and praise. And we unite our hearts together and say we love you. Father, we love you in Jesus' name. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we give you praise. And we say amen. Hallelujah. Brother and Sister Tharp, God bless you. Come on up. Well, it's nice to see you in the house of God on a Sunday night. If you've been outside, you know it's lovely in here. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> because it, it is scorching outside. Now, uh, let me just start off with this. Some of you I'm sure I've met before. Some of you I have not. Some I'm friends with on Facebook. And some of you don't like me well enough to put on Facebook. <laughs> so, and so... Uh, we have 30 albums out. You would think with 30 albums we would be professionals. If that's what you thought, <laughs> you just missed that about a mile because you can't sing with professionals. It messes them up. And you can't clap with professionals because it messes them up. But the way we sing, you can't mess that up <laughs> because we sing strictly by letter. And that simply means we open up and letter fly and so if you know the words to the song sing with us if you don't know the words but you want to sing anyway just grin and, um, grin and mumble nobody will ever know the difference now I'm going to start off with a little Pentecostal song if that's alright amen because I'm very Pentecostal <laughs> I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Well, it's shouting time in heaven. A sinner once lost is found. It's shouting time in heaven. Salvation has been brought down. No wonder the angels rejoice to know my sins have been covered by the crimson flow. Now I'm feeling fine. I'm walking on the highway with my Lord. My name is written down in the courts above. It's shouting time in heaven. Oh, yes, it's shouting time. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost. And ruin by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. Well, it's shouting time in heaven. A sinner once lost is found. It's shouting time in heaven. Salvation has been brought down. No wonder the angels rejoice to know My sins have been covered by the crimson flow And now I'm feeling fine I'm walking on the highway with my Lord My name's written down in the courts of love It's shouting time in heaven Oh yes, it's shouting time It's shouting time in heaven A sinner once lost is found It's shouting time in heaven Salvation has been brought down no wonder the angels rejoice to know My sins have been covered by the crimson flow And now I'm feeling fine Well, I'm walking on the highway with my Lord My name is written down in the courts of love 
sing a song with me, and I'm going to do you like I do the school. Some of you know that we do free concerts for kids in schools. This year will be 36 years in Ireland that we've been doing free concerts for kids in schools. <laughs> and every now and then somebody will ask me, what do you do for three months while you're in Ireland? And when I tell them we do free concerts for kids in schools, they look at me funny. I guess it could be because I'm 80 years old. And they think I'm too old to be doing schools. Well, <laughs> I can think anything they want to. They're already booking us in schools, and we're, we're more in demand in schools than we've ever been. And the reason is very simple. It's because of my handsome demeanor. Uh, I won the badge for being humbled on one Sunday morning, and they took it away from me Sunday night because I wore it. <laughs> no, I, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'd like to think it has something to do with my good looks. Unfortunately, I have a mirror, and so I'm pretty sure that ain't it. And so it's got to be the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Because I believe I'm, I'm so Pentecostal I heard. I heard somebody back here told me they were saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, and I said, Amen. Me too. And so when we do schools, I see in, in Ireland, oh, less than one half of 1% under 21 attends church. And yet, if I got a thousand kids in front of me, I'll have them do what I'm about to have you do. And every single one of them will participate. No problem at all. And see, I have no problem with kids in schools, unsaved or unsaved, makes no difference. Where I have a problem getting participation is in church. But not this church, right? So everybody, hand motions and do just what I do, okay? My God! My God! Wow. That was pretty good. Wow, Brother Timmons, did you see that? Let's try that again. My God! My God! My God! My God! My God! My God! Is a mountain mover. Is a mountain mover. That is pretty good. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I won't do the rest. We'll just sing it to you. And you'll catch it. It goes like this. We can trust him just have faith. My God is a mountain mover. My God's going to make a way. Can't count all the times he's proven. We can trust him just a hopeless situation watch him turn it all around nothing is impossible i can't hold back i've got to shout my god my god my god is a mountain mover 
Got a problem in my pathway. I feel I'm frozen here. Doubts are circling high above me, but in the shadow of my fear, the fire of faith is burning deep inside of me, reminding me of something I already believe. My God is a mountain mover. My God's gonna make a way Can't count all the times he's proven We can trust him, just have faith Take a hopeless situation Watch him turn it all around Nothing is impossible I can't hold back, I've gotta shout My God, my God, my God Is a mountain mover He's the God of mighty miracles In the days of God I will keep on trusting him. I will not lose heart. My God is a mountain mover. My God's gonna make a way. Can't count all the times he's proven. We can trust him just half day. Take a hopeless situation. Watch him turn it all around. Nothing is impossible. I can't hold back. I've got to shout. My God is a mountain mover. My God's gonna make a way Can't count all the times he's proven We can trust him, just have faith Take a hopeless situation Watch him turn it all around Nothing is impossible I can't hold back, I've gotta shout My God, my God, my God Is a mountain mover My God, my God, my God Is a mountain mover Ah, uh, praise the Lord. Well, amen. Anybody here believe God is good? We sing a country song. And the kids in Ireland, they think they invented country music. And I, I don't know, maybe they did. But because they think they invented country music, then even the kids like country music. And so it's in the schools in Ireland, they do a little dance, say, they do what's called a slide or something like that. Sort of. The sort of. Not quite. We don't know what it is. It, we just know they do it and the kids the join kids it. Made it. Amen. And but the song goes like this. God is good. Yes, he is. He's good all the time. God is good. You know he is. He's good all the time. You can search the whole world over, and no greater friend you'll find. He's not good just once in a while. He's good all the time. And now God is good. Yes, he is. He's good. The whole world over And no greater friend you'll find He's not good just once in a while He's good all the time Now we've all had friends who've let us down You know what I'm talking about At the very first sign of trouble They're nowhere to be found But Jesus stays when others go He'll never leave your side. He's not just a friend in stormy weather. No, he's good all the time. God is good. Yes, he is. He's good all the time. God is good. You know he is. He's good all the time. You can search the whole world over. And no greater friend you'll find. He's good just once in a while. He's good all the time. Well, now he's the one you call in the middle 
middle of the night When your body moans with pain Don't you worry about that wayward child Cause he heard you call his name He'll put food in your kitchen When you don't have a dime He's not good just now and then He's good all the time God is good, yes he is He's good all the time God is good, you know he is He's good all the time You can search the whole world over Ain't no greater friend you'll find He's not good just once in a while He's good all the time Anybody here ever been to Jerusalem? Anybody? Nobody's been to Jerusalem? No, we have Who wants to go? We're going. <laughs> when are you going? We're going. When are you going? You're going the to the new Jesus. Jerusalem. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. 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 Well, we've been to Jerusalem three times. The first time we went, a company called... Uh, a God, God Channel. <laughs> Don't think it was the, the God, God Channel. The God Channel. <laughs> the God, God Father. <laughs> I knew it was God something. <laughs> I make no apologies. You don't, you don't just judge her on <laughs> 51 years I have put up with that. <laughs> the lucky man. <laughs> The God Channel called, and I don't know where in the world I know them from, but they wanted me to go. And so I said, well, what about my wife? They said, no, we only have one seat. I said, well, I'm not going, not without my wife. And so I forgot about it. About three, four weeks later, they called and said, we made a way for your wife. I want you both to go. So we went. (laughs) It was an experience, I must say. We passed 80 miles an hour out there is where, they, where Samson tied the fox's tails together. Zoom right past him. Over there is where David picked up a smooth stone. Zoom right past him. I thought I, thought I was going to get to see Israel. All we got to see, we did to go to the garden tomb, and we had, we had people preaching at us. My wife and I were in a, were in a, in a meeting in a hotel. They, they were five speakers in a single day, five. And every one of them lambasted America and Britain because they weren't being treated right. And after the fourth one, I got tired of listening. So I said, let's go to our room. So we went to the room, and I was writing on a book. And so I'm sitting there writing. She's about to go to sleep. And I said, wait a minute. We're in Israel. For goodness sakes, let's go downtown. Well, they told us you can't go downtown. I said, why not? said, because don't you know that we're in the middle of a war? There's nobody going downtown because there's bombs going off and they're killing people. I said, well, I've been in Northern Ireland for several years. That don't scare me a bit because we've been bombarded with stones and we got the side window shot out of our bus. And, and so I said, we're going downtown. So we did. We had it to ourselves. There was nobody down there but just the, <laughs> just the shopkeepers. And everybody wanted to sell us something and everybody trying to give us discounts because there was nobody else on the streets. And so I wind up buying a couple things. And, uh, and so later on, a young man that I gave cassettes to when he was in school, 11 years old, 12 years old, 13 years old, I didn't know I was giving it to the same kid because he was growing. 
And the last time I gave him one, he was about that tall, and if he stuck his tongue out, he looked like a zipper. He was so skinny. And, <laughs> and him and his old family came to a church where I was in revival and got saved. And a few years, about six, seven years ago, I guess, uh, I was in, in the largest church in Northern Ireland, Whitewell Metropolitan Church, seats about 5,000. And uh, we were the special guests that night, and we came in early to set up. And this great big old dude weighed about 300 pounds, and he, he, when I walked past him, he turned and saw me, and his eyes got big, and he jumped up, and he grabbed me and started hugging me and throwing me around in a circle, saying, you remember me, you remember me. I said, no, I'm sorry, I do not remember you. Because when I saw him, like I said, he was looked like a, a broomstick. And now he weighs 300 pounds, and it's 20 years have passed almost. And he, he like, chalked my leg off, and he handed me a brochure about Israel. 1,199 pounds, that's $2,400. And I just stuck it in my pocket and forgot about it. A few days later, he called me and wanted to take us out to eat. So we went. Then he wanted me to go to his office. He owned telephone shops. And he owned a travel agency. And when I got to the, to the shop, he pushed that brochure in front of me again. And I said, Travis, if I had that kind of money, I wouldn't go to Israel. I already been once. I would spend it on buying CDs to give away to kids in schools. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, that's 1,199 pounds. That's $2,400. He said, you're not paying. And I said, well, it says right here. He said, no, 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 I'm paying. And I said, well, Miranda, the girl that was with us last year, I said, I'm not going without Miranda. He said, of course I'm paying for Miranda, too. All three of you are going 14 days, five-star hotels. You won't spend one cent. Buses, the meals, nothing. You won't spend one penny. Guess what? I went to Israel again. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, got to see, we got to see everything. But uh, on a couple of days, I decided I didn't want to go with them because they weren't going where I wanted to go. I wanted to walk around Israel and have a look for myself outside the tourist area. I have found out if you go outside the tourist area in just about any city, you see a whole different way of living. And I, I was thinking as I was walking around through the suburb that they need to learn what paint is. Broken windows. Grass need to be mowed. Garbage need to be picked up. And I'm thinking, Lord have mercy. It's, it's a shame for people to live like this in Israel of all places. But I got to read in my Bible. Hallelujah. And it talks about the new Jerusalem. And the streets are not littered with garbage. The houses do not need painting. The gates are made of pearl. The streets are made of gold. And one of these days I'm going. Amen. And I'm going to the new Jerusalem with you, brother. I, in fact, I, I, I got a mansion. Amen. I said, I got a mansion. You're all invited. Amen. We'll have a barbecue in the backyard. The song says, Jerusalem. Amen. saw the city oh yes he did john caught a glimpse of the golden throne tell me all about it go right on around the throne he saw the crystal sea there's got to be more what will it be i want to go to that city he saw New Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I want to walk your, your streets, streets that are golden, and I want to run where the angels have trod. City of 
God. Who wants to go to the new Jerusalem? Amen. John saw the lion lay down by the lamb. I want to know everything about that land. John saw the day, but he did not see night. The Lamb of God, well, he must be the light. He saw the saints worship the great I am. Crying worthy, worthy is the Lamb. I want to go to that city he saw, New Jerusalem. Jerusalem, I want to walk your streets that are golden. And I want to run where the angels have trod. sing you a song that has to do with my mama. Feet by the river of life. 
life that I live Seems that peace is sometimes hard to find I try to lighten my load When all that I've got to show Is seven hundred things on my mind I have visions of a crystal clear river Where sin's forgotten without a trace More than I've ever dreamed my eyes long to see the look of love on my Savior's face. I want to know how it feels to make my way down the streets of gold. I want to know how it feels to have a talk with the saints of old. I want to know what it's like. To rest my feet by the river of life I've heard of heaven and I know that it's real I wanna know, I wanna know how it feels To make my way down the streets of gold I wanna know how it feels To have a talk with the saints of old I want to sing you one more song, but first of all, let me introduce this young lady. Y'all didn't know that Miranda has shrunk since last year? Same girl, just shorter. No, she's not. <laughs> Katie is the daughter of the son of a pastor. Her grandfather pastors a church in Henderson, just outside of Las Vegas. Her father is the associate and the worship leader. And uh, when Miranda, Miranda is now traveling on her own as a minister. And she'll be at the camp meeting, uh, preaching three times. And she'll be with uh, Living Praise, and she'll be, I don't know who else she'll be, but she'll be in several churches. And when Miranda decided to leave us, she'd been with us 14 years. And Miranda has turned into an awesome preacher. And uh, we, were, we were asking the Lord, where in the world are we going to find anybody to take Miranda's place after 14 years? Fortunately, most every church we go to has got somebody, some young person who would love to travel with us. But I'm kind of picky who travels with me. First of all, they got to be really saved because I don't put up with no nonsense. And the second church we were in after we left home, after Miranda left us, was her grandfather's church. I had no idea who she was. She was sitting on the second row. And it had to be God because I just don't do this. When I walked by her, I looked at her, and I stopped and said, Young lady, would you like to go to Ireland? And she said, Yes. <laughs> and then I found out she had a sister. And we pick up her sister tomorrow, who graduated from school yesterday. And her sister's 18. She's 25. She thinks she's the boss, but I got a feeling that the younger sister is bigger than her. She swears she can whip her. I got to see it for myself, but but nevertheless, this is Katie. I want you to give her a nice welcome. Tonight. I just want to sing you one more song, and I want to dedicate. It's called "A Man After God's Own Heart." Uh, several years ago, I went to a funeral of a friend of mine, and uh, when I, I I was listening to all the things they were saying about him. And I thought, Lord have mercy, a lot of stuff I heard I didn't know. It always reminded me of the funeral where this woman had six kids and the husband died. And when the preacher was up talking about her husband in the casket, she nudged her oldest boy and said, Billy, go up there and see who's in that casket. <laughs> and if not that, I think about the guy who made up his own tombstone. 
He didn't trust anybody to do it, so he made up his own. And when he died, they put it up. And it said, I told you I was sick. <laughs> and so I'm trying to think what in the world would I want to put on my tombstone when I die. I'm sitting there listening to all these folks talking about him. He's in a massive big church outside of Atlanta. And I thought, Lord, do, do I want him to talk about I've written 120-some gospel songs. I'm, if you pull up smashwords.com on the Internet and put in Dr. Martin G. Tharp, 38 books will come up. In about another week, there'll be 42 books uh, because I got four that hadn't been put on there yet. And then if you go to iTunes or Barnes & Noble and put in Dr. Martin G. Tharp, the same books will come up. And they use my books for curriculum in Bible schools. We have one in Nairobi, Hungary, Romania, two in Ireland, one in Scotland, several in Mexico and across America. And I, I, I was sitting there thinking, do I want to talk about my books and the schools and songs and this thought came to me if they can honestly say here lies a man who was after the heart of God that will be the highest compliment that could ever be paid to any preacher of the gospel and so I want to sing you this little song and it's not just for the men but especially for the men I want to be a man after the heart of God Started on this journey, not seeking wealth or fame. The only thing I want in life is to bear his holy name. I've had my share of problems, trials along the way. But when the mountain gets too high, this is how I pray. I want to be a man after God's own heart. I want to be a man after God's own heart. I might stumble, I might fall, but I'll get back up to heed the call to be a man after God's own heart. Some don't understand me, they criticize my ways, but if they'd look inside my heart, they'd find something good to say. I'm not the one with the crown of thorns, nail scars in my head. I'm just a man with a real desire to be all that I can. I want to be a man after God's own heart. I want to be a man after God's own heart. I might stumble, I might fall, but I'll get back up to heed the call to be a man after God's own heart. He never said it would be easy. Sometimes the load gets hard to bear. But when I think of where he's brought me from and how much he really cares, the road don't seem so rocky when I make this my prayer. God's own heart. I want to be a man after God's own heart. I might stumble, I might fall, but I'll get back up to heed the call to be a man after God's own heart. To be a man God's own heart.
Would you stand with me, please? In honor to the word of the Lord, turn your Bible to the 17th, I'm sorry, to the 22nd chapter. Hello, praise God. 22nd chapter of the book of Luke. Chapter 22, verse number 19. Chapter 22, verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Father, I thank you for the word tonight. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to come upon our minds and hearts. May we understand a little more clearly who we are. Then grant us the courage to actually leave this building tonight acting as if we believe it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the scripture that I have read to you is one of those that I was just sitting reading my Bible. Is that all right to just sit and read? I wasn't studying for anything. I was just reading. I wrote a book several years ago called The Bread and the Cup. And when I, I wrote the book, I was actually writing it because I was aggravated. In the British Isles, every single solitary church takes communion every Sunday morning. And they would tell me, sing about four, five, six songs, preach about 35, 40 minutes, pray for folks, and we've got to be out of the building by 1230. They would start taking communion at about 11 o'clock. And at 12 o'clock, they're still messing around with communion. If the Apostle Paul had been there, he'd have told them all off. And then they would turn it to me and get upset at me because I didn't sing six songs and preach 35 minutes and still get out by 12.30. And it used to drive me literally insane. And so I, I was sitting down writing one day, and I thought, bless God, I'll just write a book about communion. Let these folks understand what communion's all about. Isn't it amazing how God had a plan before he had a man. And if we fit in that plan, see, it's amazing to me that God doesn't is not the rewarder of a casual observer. My wife and I used to live in Santa Cruz, California. And if you drove a car to the boardwalk, anybody ever been to Santa Cruz? It's a gorgeous place, isn't it? If you drove a car to the boardwalk from our house, we lived on the harbor. And uh, we, if you drove from our house to the boardwalk, uh, it, it was, took you about 15, 20 minutes. But I could walk it in about five to seven minutes if I took a shortcut across the railroad trestle. And if you cross the railroad trestle, when you're up high looking at it, you're looking, first of all, at Steamer's Lane. It's a natural arch in the rock formation that kids from all over the world come and try to ride their surfboards through it. Then there's about 10,000 lineal feet of beautiful white beach. If you look to the right is the boardwalk itself with one of the oldest roller coasters in America and all kinds of shops and things. At the end of about that 10,000 lineal feet of White Beach is, a, is a, a pier that runs about 1,000 feet out into the water. On the back side of it, they tie up these, uh, these, these real colorful-looking boats with a beautiful colored uh, uh, sails on them. It's about 35 foot wide going out there. When you got out to the end, it's 1,000 foot wide and had shops all the way around it. And people on both sides fishing. Beautiful sight. And if you look just past that, anybody ever heard the lighthouse written by Ronnie Henson? Well, that's where he wrote the lighthouses when he saw that lighthouse on the promontory at Santa Cruz. And then if you look past Santa Cruz from the beach, Santa Cruz sits in the San Andreas Mountains, and it's an absolutely beautiful sight. While I'm up on that railroad trestle, I look down there, and there's an artist. And he's got an easel set up. And he's got a canvas on it about three feet long and about two and a half feet tall, and he's painting away. Well, I'm curious, and so I kind of hurried down there to see what the guy's painting. I stood for almost 45 minutes watching him, 
And he never looked up a single solitary time. He ignored me as if I didn't exist. I kept trying to see if, is he looking, because if he looked across the water on a clear day, you could see the giant cypress trees on the Monterey Bay Peninsula. You could see all these sailboats out in the middle with these beautiful colored sails. You could see the, the boardwalk from where he was standing. You could see Steamer's Lane. You could see all of that. But I never could figure out what in God's earth is he painting. And I finally got tired of watching, and I just walked on. I was gone about 45 minutes to an hour, and I started back home. And when I was about a, a, probably a block from him, I saw he was cleaning his brushes. He had finished his painting. I took off jogging. I wanted to see this thing before he took it off that easel. And when I got there, I saw why he ignored me and why he never looked up a single time at any of his surroundings. The painting that he painted was far removed from, where he, from his location. And it, it gave me a thought, and that is this. It's just like the Bible and the God we serve. That Bible is a painting. The characters in it is the paint on the canvas. You and I have been added to that painting. And what God wants us to do is find ourselves in that marvelous painting. But he's not, he's not a rewarder of a casual observer. In other words, if you're one of those that just kind of come to church when you feel like it, if you're one of those that kind of pays tithes when you kind of feel like it, if you're one of those that you're faithful when you feel like it, God ain't ever going to reveal nothing to you. Hello. I said, God ain't ever going to reveal nothing to you. But it made a revelation in my mind that God had a plan before he had a man. And if I would read that Bible, I might figure out what his plan was. This is almost, it's almost 50 years ago. Her and I had been married only a couple of years. I was, in, I was in the construction in Santa Cruz, and I was bidding a multi-million dollar job while she was at the hairdressers. And I just decided I'd take this little walk. That little walk has made a change and, and a transformation in my life from that day clear till this because it enforced this concept that God does have a plan. And from time to time, if we will pray and believe God and allow the anointing of the Holy Ghost to touch our minds, we'll get in that plan. And when I started writing the bread in the cup, I found that God had set a plan in motion which spurred me to write the book because as I wrote it and preached on it, people started getting healed. I wasn't ready for that. I mean, there's not just 12 or 15 at a time, two and 300 at a time. I never touched anybody. We're in a church in, in Muncie, Indiana, and it's a very large church. In fact, I'll, I'm going to be preaching a portion of their 60-year anniversary, August the 12th and 13th, Sunday morning and Sunday night and Monday night. I'm the preacher. On Tuesday and Wednesday is a guy named David Ellis. On Thursday is a guy you may, may have heard of named Jesse DePlantis to finish it out. And, and at that church, I, I preached on the bread and the cup because the pastor demanded it. He heard that I was preaching on it. He heard people were getting healed, and he called me and, and demanded that I preach on the bread and the cup. So I did. On the final night, I challenged the people. If there's anybody here who has a pain of any kind, once we have taken communion, find the pain. Now, I can tell you in a Pentecostal church, it ain't hard to tell when people are getting healed. When all of a sudden they started doing all this crazy stuff and jumping and moving their arms and jumping up and down and bending over and shouting and talking in tongues. And there was a guy there who was going in the following day for emergency surgery on his right knee, had an industrial accident. And anybody here old enough to remember Chester on Gunsmoke? Oh, come on now. Don't you tell me you ain't old enough. Anybody ever remember Chester on Gunsmoke? Let me see. Well, there you are. Why don't you say so? Well, that's the way he walked. Well, that, like I said, there was over about maybe 250 people that came forward, and it's a very large church in a huge altar area, and he was at the back of the line, and he sat down. And in a minute, he got up. I didn't know what he was doing when he sat down. But when he got up, he took his ace bandage off. And that church is about two and a half times as wide as this and about ten times as long. And that guy come up from there swinging his ace bandage, running and jumping, going around and around the building. I think there might have been a pretty good chance the boy got healed. In Gadsden, Alabama is another one of those large churches. Seats about 1,700. They tried to get to us to be the pastor, but I'm, I'm committed to the British Isles, and so I declined. But I was preaching for Brother Arnold, who was the pastor, and, uh, and there was about 250 or more came forward, and I made the same challenge. And, and uh, I'm watching them, and there's one young guy at the very back in his late 20s or early 30s, and he's taking these real deep breaths, and he's crying so hard that he had wet the front of his shirt. It was totally wet with tears, and he's shaking like a leaf. And Brother Arnold tapped me on the shoulder because I, I didn't go down and pray for nobody. I just stood there and let God do it because I ain't the healer. He is. Amen. And so I'm standing there watching him with the pastor. And Brother Arnold tapped me on the shoulder and said, that guy back there is doing all that crying and gasping for breath. said, 
is that one of your friends? And I said, Brother Arnold, I never saw him before. I thought he was a new member of the church. He said, I ain't never seen him before. Well, I was talking to Tommy, Crane, Tommy Marshall, who's now the new pastor of the church when I declined. And, uh, and, 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 and I'm, I'm talking to Tommy, and I felt a tap on my shoulder. Turn around, it was that guy. And uh, he said, Mr. Tharp, uh, I, I, I think I need to get saved. I said, excuse me? He said, I, I, I think I need to get saved. And I said, didn't I just see you get healed? Oh, yes. Said I had a 10-year respiratory disease. I couldn't breathe without my breather. But God healed me. And I said, well, what church do you go to? He said, I ain't never been to church in my life. Today was my first time. And I said, never, ever been to church in your life? He said, no. And I said, why would you come? He said, my neighbor said people were going to get healed, and I need to be healed. And, and I got healed, and now I think I need to get saved if I'm going to stay healed. I met some Christians. Ain't that smart? Amen. And so I turned him over to Tommy and forgot about it. 25 or 30 minutes later, that's a huge church. It's got three main exits, but one, you can put about eight cars under it where they can get out and go in, in the rain. And I looked up, and there he stood, leaning against the wall, crying. So I went over to him, and I said, are you all right? Yeah. And I said, did you get healed tonight? Yeah. I said, did you get saved? Oh, yeah. Come to find out the devil had already convinced him if he walked out that door, he would, he would no longer be healed. I said, buddy, you just learned the most valuable lesson of your brand new Christian life. The devil is a liar. I said, do you think you'll still be saved when you go out that door? Oh, yeah. I said, all right, then. If you'll still be saved, you'll still be healed. You go on. Well, uh, he, he said he'd never gone to church before, so he couldn't have been a Pentecostal. But when we left, he was sure acting like one because he was jumping up and down screaming on the outside of the building. Amen. Brother and sister, it's amazing to me people think Pentecostals are weird, and yet folks that don't know a thing about Pentecostalism, when they get all excited, they act just like one. Amen. Well, and, and, uh, there's a guy named David Chetister in, um, in Morgantown, West Virginia. Called my wife several weeks before I'm supposed to be there in a revival. And he said, uh, Sister Sharon, what's the doc all excited about? And she said, well, I don't know what he's excited about, but I'm so excited about the bread and the cup that he's been preaching on. Brother David said, all right, you tell him he's preaching on the bread and the cup. She didn't tell me. And several weeks went by, and about two weeks before time to be there, she said, oh, by the way, forgot to tell you, David Chetister called, and he said, you're preaching on the bread and the cup. I called David and I said, David, I ain't preaching on the bread and the cup. I've been preaching on it for a year. Nobody will let me not, and I've changed. I'm not preaching on the bread and the cup. He said, yes, you are. I said, David, you're not listening. He said, no, brother, you're not listening. And I said, well, why is it you're so adamant that I got to preach on the bread and the cup? He said, well, I've already put it in the newspaper. I got ads on the radio. I've already sent out a newsletter to all the people in my church. You're preaching on the bread and the cup. I said, all right, I'm preaching on the bread and the cup. Amen. And so when I, when I got there, uh, he, he called me on Saturday night, and he said, uh, Doc, can you come in early Sunday morning? I said, well, David, I'm always early. He said, just a little extra early. And I said, is there a reason? He said, yes. He said, a young couple called, and they saw the ads in the paper or listened to it on the radio, and they want to meet you before church. I said, David, is it somebody I know? He said, I don't think so. So I, I was there early, and sure enough, about 35, 40 minutes before service, this young couple came in. And the little girl, her hands were grotesque. Her little finger was buried around in my thumb, and they were just like clubs. They didn't bend. They were, her fingers were huge and, and, and didn't bend at all. She shook my hand with her wrist. Well, normally, I never did give an altar call for people to be healed from just preaching on it one service, but I forgot all about her. And I gave an altar call for people who wanted to be healed. It's not a huge church, so about 40 people came forward. Well, David drug me to the end of the line. Some old boy wanted to talk to me, and by the time he got done jawing my ear, everybody had sat down except that little girl. So I thought she must want to talk to me. So I went back to see what she wanted. And she's standing, shaking like a leaf, like a bowl of jelly from, her, from the top of her head to the sole of her feet. And she's crying so hard she has wet herself. And she's looking down at her hands. And she's mumbling something. So I look down on her hands, and she's saying, My husband has never seen me like this. And her hands were absolutely perfectly normal. Her husband was sitting right behind her. He jumped up and looked over her shoulder. Honey, I thought we was going to have to carry him out. He went whiter than his handkerchief. And, and you see, that happened everywhere I went. Well, I first published the book with 12 chapters, but after a year of them not letting me up, I, I republished it with 21 chapters. And one day I was just reading, and I came on to Luke twenty-two nineteen. 19. 
And I'm sure the pastor can certainly attest to this. You can read your Bible again and again and again and again and again. And again. I must have read that scripture 50 or 100 times while I was writing the bread and the cup. Didn't do a thing for me. But one day I'm just sitting reading my Bible, and that scripture ate me alive. When I got a hold of that, I thought, dear God in heaven, I never saw that. And, and you see, see, what's so important about it? Think about what he said. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Here is what dawned on my thick skull. He has not been crucified. There's no stripes on his back. There's no crown of thorns on his head. There's no spear that's pierced his side. There's no nail prints in his hands or feet. Amen. There's no, there, there, the, the crown of thorns hadn't been put on his head. And so when he said to them, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, our mind is like a computer. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but our, uh, the average person only uses 11% of their brain capacity. The 11% that you use is 356 gigabytes. I have an 8 gigabyte memory stick that's got all my 44 books or 42 books, got the five that I've got in various stages of completion, my wife's three cookbooks and her two theology books, two of Miranda's books with all of the, all of the graphics. It's on an 8 gigabyte memory stick. And yet I, my 11% of my brain has the ability to have 356 gigabytes. And if you apply it, you can go over 500 gigabytes of memory. But you cannot remember anything that has not happened. Hello. And you think, see what I've always done, taking communion, I've always tried to visualize the crown of thorns on his head, the nail prints in his hand, the stripes on his back, and the spear piercing his side. Uh, but that ain't what he said. And that's what got a hold of me. Because none of that has taken place. And since none of it has taken place, what's he talking about? They walked with him for three years. And during that three years, they might remember chapter 15 of the book of Matthew. When the Bible will tell you that there was a woman who had a daughter that was grievously vexed with the devil. And they, she came crying after them. And the, Jesus ignored her the first time. Totally ignored her. Honey, I've been in church, church work long enough to know that if you ignore some, ignore some old boy one time, they'll change churches. Yellow. I said, you just ignore them once. They'll change churches. And, and this, when, he, when she kept crying after me, he finally turned and said, it, uh, it's not me. T or, or, uh, I'm only come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Didn't slow her down one bit. She kept crying after him. Chapter 15, book of Matthew, read it. She came to him again, and he turned to her, and he said, it's not me to give the children's bread to dogs. Honey, I've met folks, you don't have to call them a dog to get them all up in the air. I've met folks that if, you, if the pastor don't comb his hair right, they'll change churches. If the music's too loud, they'll change churches. If he talks about money too much, they'll change churches. If his wife wears something they think is not decent, they'll change churches. Hello? Folks love to change churches for the stupidest reasons. When I believe God from heaven, when people start in this church changing stuff, God wants to roll back to heaven and say, Shut up and sit down! Hello? Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> and she, but she didn't bother her one bit. She said, Lord, even the dogs get to lick the crumbs that fall from the master's table. In other words, if there's sugar in the bread, there's sugar in the crumb. If there's butter in the bread, there's butter in the crumb. If there's milk in the bread, there's milk in the crumb. And she recognized she didn't need a loaf. All she needed was just a crumb. And he said, great is thy faith. Be it unto you as you will. And that instant her daughter was cleansed from the devil that had vexed her. They might remember that. They might remember the fourth chapter of the book of Mark when the Bible will tell you that he said, let us go to the other side. And on the way across, the waves got heavy and the winds got boisterous and the boats filling up with water and all these men that had been raised on the Sea of Galilee as fishermen their entire lives. And there's one person in the boat, and I guess the reason he's not concerned because he ain't a fisherman, he's a carpenter. Hello? And he's sound asleep on a pillow in the bottom of the boat. And Mark 4 will tell you that they came running down and said, oh, Don't you even care that we perish? He got up and said, Peace be still. The winds quit and the waves quit. Then he turned to them and said, Oh, ye of little faith. In other words, you could have done this. Hello? Now, they might remember the fifth chapter of the book of Mark. When the Bible will tell you that a man named Jairus came to Jesus and said, My little daughter, 12 years old, she's dying, but if you'll come touch her, she'll live. 
and he started toward the house of Jairus. When he did, there's a woman that the Bible will also tell you had an issue of blood for 12 long years. She spent all her living on physicians, being healed of none, only growing the worse, that she suffered many things of the, of the physicians, only growing worse. And she said in her mind, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And all of a sudden, the Bible says in the book of Mark chapter 5, Jesus turned and said, who touched me? And they said, Lord, what do you mean? Look at the crowd around you. He said, but virtue has gone out of my body. And he looks and there's a woman hiding in the crowd. Why is she hiding? Brother, if you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that any woman with an issue of blood is unclean for seven days. Anywhere she sits is unclean for seven days. Anybody she touches is unclean for seven days. And if she mixes in a crowd, they're quite legal to take up stones and kill her. Honey, when you've spent all your living only growing worse, physicians done nothing for you, and you've come to the end of your road, she decided I'd rather have the stone. I'd rather take the stones if necessary. But in the meantime, I'm going to be healed. Amen. And I can tell you this, that the level of your need will make a, bit of, a big difference in what you have need of. Amen. Or what you have. I think they might remember the 17th chapter of the book of Matthew. When the Bible said when they came off the Mount of Transfiguration, they came to the house of Peter. And a tax collector came to the door. Now, they ain't nobody scared of the IRS. When they come to your door, you wet your britches, and then you ask them what they want. <laughs> Amen. And, and so they said, don't your master believe in paying taxes? Peter said, oh, yes. Oh, yes. He believes in paying taxes. The Bible said Jesus got him by the arm and pulled him aside and said, Peter, who owes taxes, children or strangers? Peter said, well, strangers. Jesus said, then we don't know no taxes. I met a lot of folks that like to hear that. And we don't, but it said, lest we offend them. Take a hook, go to the shore, catch a fish, look in its mouth, take the money, pay for me and you. Now, wait a minute. Peter is not a hook fisherman. Peter is a net fisherman. And if it had been me, I might have said, Lord, just wait a minute here. You remember last time you told me to cast my net on the other side after we worked all night long, and we got 253 fishes. If we did that again, and the money ain't in the first one's mouth, we could look in the second, and the 50th, and the 60th, and the 100th, and maybe it might be the 251st one. But we'll find that money if we can get all them fish. No, no. Jesus will take you outside your comfort zone. It don't matter to him whether you're a hook fisherman or a net fisherman. Just be obedient. And the Bible said he went to the shore, he caught one fish, looked in his mouth, and lo and behold, the money was there. See, the government tells us we're in recession. I have declined recession. I ain't interested in recession. Amen. The government can be in recession if they want to. You can be in recession if you want to. But for me, no, thank you. I'm not in recession. I don't plan to get in recession. Amen. I don't believe in recession. It's against my religion. And the reason is because I know the man who knows where the fish are with the money in his mouth. Hello. I think the disciples might remember that. If they don't remember that, maybe they'll remember Mark 10. Because 33 years after Jesus was crucified, Mark wrote the book of Mark. 34 years. And Mark named what three of the Gospels. There's three Gospels tell the story of the blind man. Only Mark tells who it is, Bartimaeus. And tells who his father is, Timaeus. So they must be members of the church. And it said that they told him to shut up, and he would not shut up. And finally, somebody came and said, the master's calling for you. And so the blind Bartimaeus went to Jesus, and Jesus said, what would you have me do for you? Does anybody here think Jesus is deaf, dumb, and blind? He don't know a blind man when he sees one? Hello? See, the whole principle of the Bible is ask, and you shall receive. In my ministry, I don't know how many thousands of people I've prayed for. And there's been a very, very large number of them that I've said, Honey, what do you need from the Lord? The Lord knows my need. Yeah, the Lord knows your need, you dummy. But he said, Ask and you shall receive. Hello. <laughs> so, uh, uh, <laughs> he didn't say, I want a house. He said, I want my eyes. And he got them. Amen. Instantly, his eyes were healed. The, the, I think they might remember that. Well, if he's telling the disciples that, and that's what they're remembering, think about this. What is he saying to me and you? And that's what really got a hold of me. What is he saying to me and you? I get, anybody know who, a guy named Larry Spivey? Anybody ever met Larry Spivey? 
pastor knows him. He, it was pastoring in Manteca, California. It's about six, seven years ago. I was writing the sequel that I was, I was going to make it chapter 22 of the bread and the cup. But when I passed page 250, I thought, maybe this ain't a chapter. This could be a book. And so it's called Don't Forget to Remember. And I was preaching on it. I was in about the third chapter. And, uh, and we, when I went that day, the, the, that bus wouldn't start. wouldn't even click. So I thought, well, the battery cables must be corroded, and it must be low on water. I'll fix it after church because I had a borrowed car. Well, pastor took us out to eat after church. He didn't have a Sunday night service. Well, in the afternoon, I went back, and it was a little low on water, and the battery cables were corroded. So I fixed all that, put it on a charger, left it about two and a half, three hours, and still wouldn't even click. So I told my wife, get me my computer. I'm going to write for a while. And I sat down on the couch in that coach. And, and, and the pains began in my right side so severe that after a while, I, I tell you, I thought I was going to die. Uh, Miranda, who used to travel with us, I said, Miranda, have you got any gas X? <laughs> she, <laughs> she always carried gas X in defense from me. Some of y'all will get that after a while. And so she, brought, she got me a couple of gas X. It didn't do any good and just got worse. And within about an hour, I'm telling you, I, I, if you just touched me, it felt like you shot me. If I cleared my throat, it felt like a grenade went off inside of me. And once I thought I was going to sneeze, and it felt like an atom bomb went off inside of me. And I got to where I couldn't focus. My eyes wouldn't focus. I couldn't think. And so I called Pastor Spivey and I said, Brother Spivey, if you had to go to the hospital, which one would you go to? There's two or three hospitals in Manteca. He said, who needs to go to the hospital? I said, I'm afraid I do. I'll be right there. And he hung up. And sure enough, he came about five, six minutes, led my wife 100 miles an hour to doctor's hospital in Manteca. And there was about this many people already in front of me. And I was sitting down in a chair and laying back as far as I could. It's the only way I could get into relief is almost laying down. And I heard this horrendous, loud groan from somebody. And I'm looking around to see who it is, and everybody's looking at me. Discovered I did it. And a few, I didn't know I did it. In a few minutes, I did it again. And so at that point, man, they come and got me. I guess they thought I was going to die in the outer office. So they quickly came and got me, took me in, took a, a urine sample, blood sample, and did electrocardiogram and laid me out on this bed. This kind of laid down, and the pains kind of eased up. Let me sit there for about an hour or so, and the lady came with a wheelchair to take me to x-ray. I, I, when I sat down in that chair, oh, man, the pains accelerated again. And she laid me down on a table. When she laid me down, I started passing out. My eyes, I couldn't see anything. I started going blind. And so I rolled off the table said, I can't do this. You'll have to x-ray me standing up. So they did. They took me back to the room and did a sonogram. Anybody ever had a sonogram? Anybody ever? Sonogram ain't jack. I mean, you, you put a little salve on, it ain't nothing. Well, they came in in the sonogram, and she put some salve on me. And I looked down, I just knew she had six-inch fingernails, and she was burying them in my side. And, and then when she put that metal thing to me, I started that loud groaning again. I couldn't help it. And I was passing out. My eyes went blank. I couldn't think. And, and she finally gave up and said, I'm going to have to have the technician read this. And then they came with a morphine drip. And, uh, and I said, no, I ain't taking no morphine drip. They said, well, it'll mask all the pain. It'll, you won't know anything. I said, that's the point. I won't know anything. I said, if I'm going to die, I'd like to be awake to see it if you don't mind. Amen. And so I refused the morphine. At about 1230, they came and said, you're going to have to have a CAT scan. That's $3,500, Now I don't have any insurance. I don't have no Medicare, no Medicaid, no nothing. And so I said, no, I'm not taking no CAT scan. Give me a, give me a bill and give me, a, give me a prescription, and if I'm worse tomorrow, I'll come back. So they did. Gave me the bill with a prescription, $5,481 for just the hospital. Didn't include the blood sample, the, blood, the, the, the urine sample, didn't include the electric cardiogram, didn't include the x-ray, didn't include the, the nothing else. Just the hospital, $5,481. Come back, you got to be joking. I figure I can bury me and my bus for that. Amen. And so we got some medication at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I went home and went to, went to bed in that bus. And the next day, I don't remember much, except about 5 o'clock, Brother Spivey came, woke me up with a mechanic. One of my cables had busted on the thing, so they fixed that, and my bus is running again. And so I, I said, well, honey, bring me my computer. I'm going to write for a while. Three hours, I never finished a single sentence. I couldn't think. And the pains began to accelerate again. And so I took medication, and I went out of it. Uh, during the night, I began to dream. 
and I dreamed about the guy in Muncie with the ace bandage. I didn't see him when he did it because he disappeared behind the crowd. But in my dream, I'm watching him while he's taking that ace bandage off and watching God heal that leg. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I didn't see the guy in, in Gadsden, Alabama get healed when he got healed of the respiratory disease. But in my dream, I'm standing there watching God take that away and heal him. I didn't see the little girl get healed with her fingers in, in, uh, in, in Morgantown, West Virginia. But in my dream, I'm standing there watching her as those things went from grotesque down to perfect. As she just simply did this and they started working just fine. I didn't see any of that. I see, I, I didn't see none of that stuff. But I tell you in my dream, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing all this stuff and shouting and praising God because of what I'm seeing. And then in my dream, all of a sudden, I'm watching that woman chasing Jesus in Mark chapter 5. And the woman became me. And in my dream, I'm thinking, I can't let him get away from me. I got to touch the hem of his garment. And I ran and leaped and landed on my side. But I touched him. And he stopped. And he turned and smiled at me and pointed to me and said, As your faith is, so be it unto you. I woke up at 5.30 in the morning shouting and talking in tongues. I got up and went into the bathroom, forgot I couldn't sit down. No pain whatsoever. That bus, my bathroom is just far from here to that chair from my bed. And I went back, started back to my bed and sneezed. No pain. I cleared my throat. No pain. I banged on my side. No pain. I haven't had any pain from that day to this. And it made me recognize this. It's no wonder she said as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. And it dawned on my thick skull. The way I get healings and the way God manifests is if we can think about something that he's already done and we know it was him. If we can get that in our minds and remember the glories of seeing the manifestation of the power of God in our lives or in somebody else's life. It's why one of the chapters of that book is building blocks for your house of faith. Because I have found as I have preached on this that people are getting healed just like the did when I was preaching on the bread and the cup because if I can get people to think about what God's already done for them and they need a miracle now if they can get in their mind what God's already done it makes it a whole lot easier to get what you need from God right now amen and I ain't done I quit stand up let me ask you this how many in this crowd do you need a miracle of any kind? Physical, financial, spiritual, situational. You need a miracle of any kind. Raise your hand. Put your hand down. I wonder if you know somebody that's either a friend or a relative, and they need a miracle. They're not here tonight, but you could come stand in for them. Let me see your hand. Everybody that raised your hand, come join me around the altar. For whatever reason, you raised your hand. Come join me. Hallelujah. Come on up close. Plenty of people coming behind you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me challenge you to do this first. I'd like for you to just close your eyes. And visualize the last miracle you know it was God. Any kind of a miracle that God has done for you, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, if it's relationship, if it's spiritual, but you know beyond a shadow of a doubt it was God. When you get that in your mind, raise your right hand. Get in your mind what you need from God and raise your other hand and tell him what you need. Ask and you shall receive. Ask and you shall receive. Hallelujah. Ask him. Open your mouth and tell him what you have need of. Don't be embarrassed. You don't have to shout it out, but you've got to open your mouth and you tell the Lord what you have need of. And believe him right now. The Bible says if we know he hears us, we also know we have the petition that we ask of him. I tell you tonight, I know that God hears us. I said, I know that God hears us. So receive from the hand of the Lord right now in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Receive it from him right now in the name of Jesus. Receive your miracle in the name of Jesus.
not badly mistaken, I'm watching some miracles take place right now. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm watching some miracles take place. Let him have it. Let him have it in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Lord, we give it to you tonight. In the name of Jesus, we turn it over to you in your precious name. We believe it for miracles around this altar. Before I send you back to your seat, let me just throw this little thought on you. At 26 years old, I was pastoring a church in Gilbert, Arizona. I'd been sick for about eight weeks. I woke up one morning and I had no feeling in my legs. I thought I slept wrong. So I slapped my legs, I pinched my legs, no feeling. I got a pin and put a bunch of holes in my legs trying to feel something. I was bleeding like a stuck hog, but I still couldn't feel anything. After an hour of doing that, I called Clint Matthews, the deacon in my church. I said, Clint, I don't know what's going on, but I, I'm, in, I'm in trouble. I need, I need you to get me to a doctor. He came and picked me up like a baby and took me to a doctor in Mesa, Arizona. Eight and a half hours later, after all kinds of tests, I was in there all day long. Because I called Clint at about 8 o'clock in the morning. I heard him call for the ambulance. And I started yelling. And he came to see what I was yelling about. And I said, is that ambulance for me? He said, it is. And I said, Doc, I'm not going to the hospital. I believe God's going to heal me. He said, Mr. Tharp, I know you're a preacher, and I know you have faith in God. But I've got a mountain of tests that I've done all day long. If you'd have come to me three or four weeks ago, there was a chance. But he said, right now, there is no chance whatsoever. All we're trying to do is save your life. You ain't never going to walk again. You ain't never going to feel anything. And your legs, from, from your waist down, you're going to be paralyzed. You're going to be in a wheelchair the rest of your life. Well, I argued and argued and argued, and finally... He agreed if Clint Matthews would bring me in every morning at 9 o'clock, he'd let me go home. So every morning, Clint brought me in. At 10, at 10 days later, he called me and said, Mr. Tharp, I made an appointment for you at 28th and Van Buren for psychiatric evaluation. Anybody knows Phoenix, 28th and Van Buren is a local nuthouse. And I refused to go. I said, why do you think I need that? And he said, because you're going to drive yourself crazy and everybody around you crazy because you won't accept the fact you're never going to walk again. Never. Well, I still disagree. On Sunday morning, 16 days after that event, about 20 of my men was around my bed praying for me. And something happened inside of me. And I started yelling, everybody stop, everybody stop, 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 stop. You ever try to get a bunch of tongue talkers to shut up? I finally got them stopped. I said, how many times have we done this? Well, I said, don't you think it's about time we thank the Lord? The Bible says if we know he hears us, we know we have the petitions. They all looked at me like, Pastor, what's wrong with you? You can't thank him for what? I hadn't been able to move or wiggle my toes in that 16 days. And I wiggled my toes and they worked. I slapped myself on the leg and it hurt. And I yelled, get out of my way, and I got out of the bed. When I stepped up, those guys tore my room to smithereens. Two guys tore my bed down, falling on it. One guy knocked my lamp over, and another one crushed it. Another guy, his elbow went through the sheetrock in my bedroom. I, they, I, they went nuts. And that morning, I got behind my pulpit. My church was about half again bigger than this. I never did it before. I ain't never done it since. But I, I, I'm, I'm thinking, hallelujah, this ain't no joke. I am healed, and I took off running around and around the building. About the third time, I thought, psychiatric evaluation. And I thought, they're going to think I've lost my ever-loving mind. I threw on the brakes. What I had failed to notice was about three-fourths of the crowd following me around and around the building, and I liked to get ran down. The bottom line is this. I would not be walking today, I'm quite sure. If I hadn't dared to thank him for what I couldn't feel, for what I couldn't see, for what looked like an impossibility, but I tell you, the word does not change. And I believe because I confessed that I know he hears me when I pray. I know he hears me. And he said if I ask and I know he hears, I'm going to get what I ask him for. Don't you think tonight, regardless of how you feel, regardless of your circumstances, don't you think it would be all right if you just raised your hand and told the Lord thank you? Amen. I said just raise your hands and give him some praise tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Just what I 
wanted from the Lord. I got just what I wanted. I got just what I wanted. I got just what I wanted from the Lord. Well, I got just what I needed. I got just what I needed. I got just what I needed from the Lord. I got just what I needed. I got just what I needed. I got just what I needed from the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, we, there, the table is out there. We're not trying to start a bookstore, but we are trying to support a ministry. The books are $10 a piece, three for 25 We take credit cards. And uh, if you can't find what you want out there, look on smashwords.com, itunes.com, or barnesandnoble.com. Put in Dr. Martin G. Tharp. God bless you. Thank you so much. We believe that a man is worthy of his hire, his wife, and his companions traveling with him. There is, are we going to have the baskets up here or in the back? Brother Romero, would you come on up here? We're going to receive an offering for these dear folks. And whether or not you have received anything from the Lord, fall on your knees. He's still here. God is still here. And he will receive your heart. He will receive what you have to give. And tonight as we give, give it as unto the Lord. When you hang on to your money and you want to say, this needs to go here and this needs to go there and this needs to be this way, you're not trusting God. You're not trusting the Lord to just give it and let him do what he wants to with it. And I'm just going to ask you to stand on your feet. Reach into your pockets, reach into your wallets, reach into your purses, reach into your husband's pocket, your wife's purse. Do what you need to do to get an offering in your hand. This is not your tithe. This is an offering. It's, the Lord tells us very specifically that the tithe belongs to him. That's the first tenth our kids are learning about it. But the offering is what God says, if you will be a generous giver in your offering, that's what he can pour back into your life, multiplied and running over. Amen? Stand with me. You're still sitting down. Get up. Hallelujah. We're going to receive this offering, and we're just going to thank God for it. And I want, I want to do it just a little different. Just come right on up here and put your offering in the basket. And just bless the Lord and bless these dear people. Bless them with goodness and with the love of God. We're going to pray. We're just going to say, Jesus, you are in control. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you. We thank you. We give you honor and glory for this message tonight, for your word tonight, for your life that you have infused into us tonight. Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you for the provision that you're giving to Brother and Sister Tharp. We thank you, God, for their lives, for their faithfulness, for their ministry. Lord, now in Jesus' name, minister to them. Minister to them a multiplied blessing, Father, that that will be sufficient to meet their need. And we thank you, God, that as we give, we're cheerful givers. We love you, Lord. We love to give, and we love to bless your people. Father, in Jesus' name, bless them. Bless the gift and giver in Jesus' name. We thank you for it, and we say amen. Hallelujah.
As the distance spread, as the shadows grew, and the longings came like wolves to devour you. So stay up with me, don't fall asleep. Cause we only have this moment once in our lives. And next time we'll meet under city lights. Tonight, so let's make it all it was meant to be. Tried to stand my ground, tried to understand, but I can't seem to find my faith again. Like water on the sand, or grasping at the wind, I keep on falling short. So please be my strength, please be my strength, cause I don't Sustain it. It's your love that's keeping me. Please be my strength. Please be my strength. I don't have any more. I don't have any more.
had my final breath I hope that I can say I fought the good fight of faith I pray your glory shine in this doubting heart of mine and all, all would know that you
was 19, you were 21. The year we got engaged, and everyone said we were much too young, but we did it anyway. We got the rings for 40 each from a pawn shop down the road. We said our vows and took the lead now, 15 years in the end. And we went dancing in the minefields. We went sailing in the storms. And it was harder than we dreamed, but I believe that's what the promise is for. Well, I do are the two most famous last words. to begin Cause the only way to find your life is to lay your own life down And I believe it's an easy price for the life that we have found And we're dancing in the minefields We're sailing in the storms And this is harder than we dream But I believe that's what the promise is for So there's nothing left to fear. So I'll walk with you in the shadowlands till the shadows disappear. Cause he promised not to leave us and his promises are true. So in the face of all this chaos, maybe I can dance with you. So let's go dancing in the
once was a sinner I knew men that once was a drunk I knew men that once was a loser he went out in the woods and made an altar out of a stone and me and Jesus got our own thing going me and Jesus got it all Tell us what it's all about We can't afford No fancy preaching We can't afford No fancy church We can't afford No fancy singing but don't you know God's got a lot of good people out doing his work And me and Jesus got our own thing going Me and Jesus got it all worked out Me and Jesus got our own thing going And we don't need Tell us what it's all about Me and Jesus Got our own thing going Me and Jesus Got it all worked out Tell us what it's all about to you. Do I lift up my soul? You are the only course that I know. When shame denies me a place in your fold, in your love, remember me. Show me a road with respect to the truth. Hold not against me the sins of my youth. There's no one to turn to if you won't come through. In your love, remember. 